this late night. It might be very early in Europe, but I appreciate it. And I'm excited to talk about this. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into the differences between STEM education and VR versus 2D PC. All right. So I guess I'll turn. Is, is, Laura, is someone here to advance the slides? Can I say next slide and that'll happen? There we go. I'm Mina Johnson Glenberg. I'm a research professor at Arizona State University, and I wear a second hat. I'm also the founder of a spin out company called Embodied Games. And um, we specialize, if you go to the next slide, in making um, educational games for like fourth graders, lifelong learners. And, you know, my big shtick is that I care a lot about STEM, and I care about teaching uh, girls and underrepresented minorities about uh, STEM content. And uh, um, I've recently gotten into XR in a big way. Um, actually, I was just waiting for it to come of age, and so that's very exciting, right? That XR is here. We've got you know straight-to-consumer headsets. So I'm really excited to just throw all my energies into making great XR content for anyone who wants to learn STEM. Um, what I'd like to focus on on today are some of the recent randomized control trials that have been published on STEM learning outcomes, comparing the virtual reality uh, immersive headsets and 2D PC platforms. Next slide. And you think there'd be more though, right? I think they're about to start coming out, like a whole spate of them will come out soon, but they've, they, there's not that many to date. I, I only picked about seven to focus on. But before I jump into that, let's talk about what makes learning with VR special, right? Because not everything should be in VR. VR has certain affordances, and we propose that there are two profound affordances that help STEM learning. The first one, and actually these have been published in an article uh, in Frontiers in Psychology, so you can go there, there's the link. Or if you just type in Johnson Glenberg Frontiers, hopefully you'll find it. Next slide. And so, we profound affordances. And the first affordance, I think everyone will agree with, is this idea of presence, right? And so you can connect so deeply with the content. Also, presence and being in 360 allows you so many different viewpoints of the content, from the canonical, that makes sense, to just odd points of view. And that's really special as well. Another thing that's kind of cool is that you're isolated from the outside world when you're in the headset. And when we took some uh, Go headsets to a high school in downtown Phoenix uh, a few months ago, a teacher said, this is the first time I've seen that kid without his earbuds in, right? Because, you know, kids today, there's just so much input from the environment and the world that to get out of that and into a headset where that's all inclusive and all enclosed is actually a profound thing. It makes them really focus on the content. So that's one of the amazing things about uh, VR. Next slide. The second profound affordance has to do with how you can uh, manipulate content in the, in the virtual space. Um, so this is a slide I grabbed from Nano. They do some really amazing stuff with chemistry and molecules, and that's a good use case, right? I underlined these words embodied manipulation of content in 3D, because each of these concepts is important. The embodiment, using your physical body and gesture to manipulate things. The manipulation, moving around in 360, taking uh, something from in front of you, moving it behind you, that's important. And just the kinesthetics of moving your body are important to learning. And then the idea of being in three dimensions is special. So all of those come together to make this a second profound affordance. Next slide. Before I go deeper, let me just take a few minutes to talk about what is embodiment in education. So the mind and the body are inextricably linked. There's lots of research showing that the body can help us learn by using gesture or using full body movements. If you read any of uh, Susan Golden Meadows' corpus on learning math, um, there's like a decade and a half of research showing that the body helps us learn, even going back to Maria Montessori, who was a big proponent of using the hands. 
Um, we've proposed a, um, uh, a taxonomy for the amount of embodiment in an educational module. And there are three axes to this, right? The first axis would be, does it, does it increase the feeling of uh, immersion and presence? The second is, is there congruence to the gesture, right? Is there meaningful congruence? So if I'm teaching you about gears, I want to make something where your hand is spinning like this. That's a meaningful congruent gesture to learning about the rotation of a gear. And finally, the third axis might be magnitude of gesture. Are bigger gestures better than smaller gestures? And that's a research world that um, people need to look at more. We know that incongruent gestures hurt learning, but we don't know about the magnitude of gesture. So uh, VR affords us bigger gestures if we're just holding the hand controls. And so it's kind of a cool new world out there that could be researched, should be researched. Next slide. So what does it mean? I'll go into each of these terms with, an, with one more slide each, right? So what does it mean to manipulate with gesture, right? If you're manipulating content, it's going to be so cool that we can now do it with our favorite natural user interface, the hand, the human hand. You don't even have to hold a hand controller. Like if the Quest hand control stuff works out, it'd be so, you know, it'd be great to just put your hand in front of your, you know, headset and have it immediately be tracked. And this is a little slide I grabbed from Wikipedia because this is one of my favorite, you know, physics examples of what you can do with the hand. It's the right hand rule for looking where the magnetic field is coming off of a coil. So the direction of the thumb is the flow, and then the way the fingers curl is the magnetic field. And if I turn my thumb upside down, it's going to flow a different way. And now you can do that in VR and have the vectors and arrows flow with your hand as it moves. So that's pretty cool. Someone's going to design that. <laughs> we might do it next year, but if we don't, God love you. Anyone go out there and make that. Next slide. Yeah, so what is so special about 3D, right? Like, I mean, there's lots of great 2D content made on a PC. Should all that 2D content just be ported straight to 3D? Put out a heart if you think that's true. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's a savvy audience. No hearts here. Because, yeah, I mean, some content is done perfectly well in 2D. Why spend the extra money? It's expensive, as you know, to make 3D content, right? So why do that? I think, I think 3D and VR should be saved for the content that is well done in 3D and VR. And so this is an example of, it's really hard to see, sorry, but, um, you know, arrows going, again, in the north and south parts of magnets showing the magnetic field around a bipolar magnet. Like, that's a great use of 3D. Next slide. So I, I, what I'm going to do next is talk you through a few studies that have been done, um, randomized control trials. And as you look at those, ponder what are the best uses of immersive VR, given, again, that it's more expensive than 2D development. And so, you know, what do we want to see going forward for education in VR using natural interfaces with the hands and hand controllers? Next slide. I'll just start with an older study uh, done by Gutierrez in 2008. They were training medical students on traumatic brain injury. They had two conditions, a VR HMD, like an old school heavy headset, and then a flat, what they call flat screen which some people call desktop or PC. I like to call it PC because it's shorter, but you know what I'm talking about, just on a monitor. Um, and they always hold the content constant. So it's the same stuff you're learning in the VR HMD, you're learning that on a desktop as well. They found significant effects for learning that favored the VR group, right? And that's kind of what I would expect just because I'm someone who likes VR so much. They did a really interesting dependent variable. The DV was um, a card sorting task. so. The participants who were medical students would uh, take cards with ideas and sort them into piles. And if they did it more like an expert doctor did, an expert MD, then they were considered to have learned more. So it's kind of an old school thing that cognitive psychologists have done before. But I, I don't see it often in studies like this. So I just wanted to bring attention to that. Like there's lots of ways to get at the idea of learning, right? Most people do pre and post tests with declarative knowledge. That's what we did in the study. but. Um, this one, they did a card sorting task. So, next slide. That's an old, 
study and now looking at the recent stuff that's come out with the new spate of headsets um honestly guys it's like mixed results right it's kind of all over the place so i'm gonna i'm gonna talk to you about the three different ways it can come out it can come out either favoring the uh, vr condition or the pc condition or they can be equal so i'm going to focus on stem here and i'm only going to talk about the rigorous rcts that happen and those, these are people who know how to run studies they have good control groups uh, people are randomly assigned and so those are the ones i'm focusing on next slide Uh, this is a re recent one by Krokos on spatial memory. Again, two conditions, immersive VR with an Oculus DK2, and they compared it to a PC condition. The dependent variable was spatial memory for famous faces. I think they had about 30 faces that would show up in different places around this you know, memory palace. The results were significantly better on recall of the faces for the VR group. So maybe you would expect that with something spatial, huh? Next slide. So these next studies showed no difference. This is one by Madden et al. called Ready Learner One. We love that name, don't we? And um, they had three conditions. They had a hands-on condition where the uh, participant is actually holding, I think it's a styrofoam ball and moving it around a light, okay? Because they're learning about phases of the moon. The second condition, they are actually uh, sitting on a PC and looking at a simulation of that. And I think they're interacting as well with the mouse. And in the third condition, they're in an Oculus Rift with the bimanual hand controls and they're able to move uh, the sun around, what are they doing? They're moving the moon around the sun. No, they're moving the moon around the earth and the sun is visible. And uh, it's a fully immersive, you know, Oculus Rift situation. The dependent variable was declarative learning. So how much do you know about this moon phase knowledge? And actually the results were interesting. There were no significant differences in moon phase knowledge uh, between the uh, PC and hand control and actually uh, with the physical condition as well, right? So everyone's learning the same. There was some interesting uh, interaction with gender by amount of game playing. Now, it was, it was an interesting study because it was two-thirds female, and so there weren't that many males in there, but all the males who were in the study had a lot of gaming experience and were used to um, moving around in like PCs and also more comfortable with the, the Oculus Rift setup. And uh, I think the boys learned more. So that was sort of an interesting thing. When you run these studies, you should be looking at your gender effects and looking at amount of time in gaming and, and uh and also, if it's a science domain, looking at number of semesters or, or how much previous science as well. So to keep all that tidy. All right, so this was a good study by uh, people at Cornell showing no difference in learning. Next slide. This was a recent study. It's a dissertation defense now, but will hopefully be published in the next 10 months or so. Um, again, he had three conditions. One that's called low, medium, and high immersivity. In the low immersive situation, there's no interactivity. Um, the participants are watching a video and doing some reading about lab safety. In the mid immersivity condition, they're on a 2D PC platform and they're manipulating the content with a mouse. And then in the high one, they're in a daydream VR and they're manipulating with uh, the single hand controller. The content was lab safety, and that was developed by Labster, if you know them. Um, you know, it was actually not explicitly 3D content. So the lab safety stuff, it's a lot of declarative knowledge. It's not so contingent on spatial and three-dimensionality. So that's just one of my points that I like to make. When you're making content for VR, you should be working in a domain that's highly spatial. That's where you're going to get most bang for your buck, okay? So this is a slide of uh, Dr. Spiedis' data and, oh my God, I can't even read it. I got to turn around. Here we go. Ah, Pre-test, they're totally matched. At post-test, you see that the high and mid level, the PC and VR are doing better. And by follow-up, those gains are maintained. So that's sort of interesting. I guess in the end, I would say that this study found no difference between PC and VR. Next slide.
So here's a study, um, I find it a bit anomalous, that favored the desktop condition over VR. And so give me a heart if you've read this study, the mccransky mayer study. And by the way, I have these all at the very end of this talk. I have a, a references slide with all these studies mentioned and where they were post, where they came out. So you can look at that. Hopefully we're gonna publish these slides. I don't know, is that right? Will presenter slides be published? You can share them if you if, yeah, all right, I'd like to share that. And if not, and if you can't find them, just email me at mina.johnson at asu.edu. Oh, I hope I put my, I hope I put my email up there somewhere. If I didn't, you can find me. Happy to share all this with you guys. All right, so here's the McCransky study, which I found fascinating when it came out. I'm like, there's something, I gotta go deeper in this and figure it out. So here, here's what I know about this study. They had two conditions. Um, they had, uh, ooh, they were counterbalanced. So they had, so when something's counterbalanced, it means that participants did both. They were in the PC first and second in the VR, or they were either in the VR first and second in the PC. So they went through both kind of situations, and um, they were randomly assigned to that. They were in a Samsung Gear VR, same content in both, again designed by Labster. The results, exact knowledge gains favored the, uh, the PC condition, but they were not significant. Um, the first time around. It was only the second time around when they were in that headset. They also did something interesting. They, they got um, EEG data with 16 sensors on the skull. So they were getting some EEG waves and looking at those patterns, they were able to deduce if they had higher or lower cognitive load. So that was one of the first studies to do that. So that was pretty cool. Participants who were first in the PC condition and then put into VR displayed EEG results that look like cognitive overload, but that was only during the second exposure, right? When people in the VR condition were in the first exposure, they didn't show that. And so what this says to me is that perhaps there are fatigue effects over time. The first time, so this means like the first 20 minutes you're in the VR headset, you're doing fine. It's not like you're looking more fatigued than PC. But by the time you go in there a second time in the same day of the study, you're having a different, you know, EEG signature that is equated with cognitive overload. So I just want to, you know, if anyone ever says to you, oh, people in VR don't learn as much because the McCransky study shows this, you need to say, well, it didn't the first time they were in a headset, but it did the second time. I think that's an, uh, an important fact. Next slide. The other thing you should know about this study is, you know, if you've ever been in gear, uh, it, this was an early version of the gear. And so the way that you maneuvered around this environment, this lab environment, was by, by, by pushing the um, headset, you know, there's the four controls on the headset, and so there were no hand controls, it wasn't even a mouse, it was the touchpad on the side of the HMD. And they even admit in the article that the specific advantages of immersive VR were not optimized, that it was an unintuitive controller, so I think we would all agree with that, and you know, the tech has moved on since then but hats off to them for doing this study early on. Next slide. So this was a meta-analysis done by Radianti, recently published, you know, just sort of claiming that there's a dearth of learning outcome studies, and I feel that as well. I mean, I really had to comb to find these seven studies or so. It's a common lament that learning theories are often not included in these articles as they write up application development. And also the evaluation of educational applications has mainly focused on usability and not on learning outcomes. So I'm just making a call that we need more of those out there, my friends. If you're working with VR in the schools, please do a learning outcome study as well. Next slide. So now I'm going to focus on a study that we just finished in my lab, um, like literally just finished. And so we're writing it up now. It's not published, but hopefully it will be in a few months. It's based on a free game that's actually now in the Oculus Store called Catch a Mimic. Um, it teaches about natural selection. It's very embodied in that kids are holding a net and they're catching butterflies with the net. Uh, it just came out yesterday in uh, Greek, Spanish, and French, so we're excited about that. So if anyone wants to use that as an experiment, 
to make a comparison with localized languages or even to make the comparison with 2D versus 3D. Um, I have that in 2D that can be played in WebGL and also now clearly it's in um, 3D VR in the Go and Rift formats. Next slide. So this was naive of me to put um, my trailer link here thinking I could like click on the link and show you the trailer. Wait, what's happening? Oh my God, I clicked on the link. Okay, it's just going to the next slide. But yeah, we're not gonna try to play the trailer now, but it's just a 50 second trailer. Please feel free to look that up at embodiedgames.com. So I guess just quickly to tell you about the game, you're catching certain butterflies and their patterns are changing as the levels get harder and we're teaching you about mimicry. So how do butterflies mimic non, how do the non-poisonous butterflies begin to mimic the poisonous butterflies? So it's very engaging, it's super short, like just eight minutes, kind of made for fourth graders on up. And we turn this into a study. So it's a two by two by three design, 100, uh, 219 undergraduates have gone through it we had um, two factors, and each factor had two levels. So factor one, with active embodiment, you were either catching the butterflies with a net by moving your hand Just around, either with the mouse or using the hand controller and the go headset, or you were on a PC and you were either, and you were just watching playback. If you're in low embodiment condition, you're just watching the playback on the screen. The second factor was immersivity, and that was either low, being in a PC, or high, being in the Oculus Go VR situation. So again, low would just be on a laptop PC, and high would be in the Go. Next slide. So just kind of quickly threw up the post-test means here. We're just in the middle of analyzing this, but you can see by the means, it's sort of interesting that um, in the low embodied PC, they actually do okay, right? If they're just watching the video, people catching butterflies, they're learning a lot about natural selection. If they're in the high embodied PC, it goes down a little, that's not statistically significantly different, but it's not as good. And then when they're in the low embodied VR, they really don't do that well. They do the best, you won't be surprised, in the high embodied VR condition. So those were the greatest gains, and they did significantly better there than the low embodied VR. Next slide. Let me show you what that looks like in a graph. I really hadn't predicted this, that the worst condition would be the high embodied VR, and why might that be? We'll go to the next slide there. We don't have to look at little numbers on the screen. That's crazy. All right, so here the bold red line is showing you how they did. They all started the same at pre-test. Yay, we like to see that. And then by post-test, the high embodied VR is significantly lower. I'm sorry, the low embodied VR is significantly lower than the high embodied VR group. So they really kind of, everyone came up, of course, they're all learning more, but uh, that group came up less. And so you're really being sort of penalized. You're doing worse. If you're, in the go, if you're in the Go headset and you're not able to use the net and use your body and gesture, you, you suffer, you do worse than if you were in a high embodied condition. You actually even do worse than PC. So that was sort of fascinating. Next slide. And what that says to me is that when you're passively watching content in a 2D space on a PC, that might be okay, right? But when you're in virtual reality and you have the expectation of control and agency, then it's very infelicitous for learning. You're not gonna learn as much. And so as we go forward designing VR curriculum, we should be thinking about the affordances of VR and taking care of, of what it does well and what the expectations of the user are. So if you have a hand control in your hand and you're expecting to be able to move it around and catch butterflies, you better make sure that your participants can do that or they're not going to learn as much. Next slide. So I think I wanna to end tonight um, by talking quickly about a uh, quality rubric that we've designed because I think teachers really want this, right? They, you know, with more VR content becoming available for education, they wanna know what's the, what are the better quality modules out there, which ones work and which ones don't and which ones did, did people like. And so this is just a rubric that we designed. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna send it out as a, 
it's a chapter that that's due this summer, but before, but even before that, it's here on the Embodied Games website, Embodied Hyphen Games. And if you go to Blog Tools, you can download this 20-item rubric. Next slide. And I don't know why I torture you by putting this tiny little font up here, but it kind of looks like this, right? It's just sort of a 20 item, 21 items designed just for educators. So it's, it's not, you know, it's not too intense. I have a few pages behind it that talk about what each uh, item is and the research behind why each item was put in there. You would score the module anywhere from a zero to three and then that's normalized to come out to be around 100%. So, you know, whatever module you go through is gonna come out to be anywhere from like a 50 to 100 on this rubric scale. Quiver, quality of education in virtual reality rubric. So, please feel free to use that and please give me feedback on it because we just keep wanting to make it better and better and more useful. Maybe 20 items is too much, right? Maybe it should just be 13. So if you all wanna help me figure out how to make it tighter, I would really appreciate that feedback. Next slide. Oh my gosh, that went really quick. Oof, hope I didn't talk too fast, but I think I'll open this up for questions and um, would love to hear from you after this as well. Thank you so much for your time. Everyone, please give Nina a round of applause. Yee, thank you, lots of claps, yee, hearts. <laughs> Just is such a fun space to present in, thank you. <laughs> next slide, you can see the references next slide, I think. Cool, so Mina, would you like to answer some questions then? I would, yeah, I'd love to. Okay, hey, everyone in the audience. So if you look on your bottom right hand of your screen, you should see a raise hand button. So what you're gonna do is if you have a question, raise that hand and then we're gonna call on you. So let's start off with uh, Mark Anster. You're on megaphone. Hi, Mark. Oh, I can't hear it though. Do I need to take something off? Mark, can you try muting, unmuting yourself? Okay, well, we can't hear you, but if you are able to fix your audio, we can come back to you. Let's you move sure on to... On, are you sure you clicked on Mark? Because I'm able to unmute myself suddenly. Oh, okay, go yes. ahead and ask your question. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, it was a comment, uh, basically. Number one, I wanted to uh, express appreciation for what you've done because um, this is, number one, the whole system is great, but number two, you, you're trying to quantify things, which I think is great. But here's here's where I'm coming down to. Um, I'm try try to oh, oops. Oh, just bailed for a second. Um, I, um, I have an example, if you will. Um, Diary of Anne Frank, that's uh, on the quest, right? Let's just say yeah. that I took Let's say that I went through there and I remembered virtually nothing from having watched it. But if I had a bunch of um, index cards, I remembered 25% of the facts. I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to read a bunch of index cards. So <laughs> there's, a, there's a quality to the fact that it is a V, a v not a VR necessarily, but it's, it's a video or a VR or something else that makes a person at least get 5% or 2% that they wouldn't have gotten in any other case. Nobody's going to sit there and, uh, if you follow what I'm saying, nobody's going to go and get the index cards to, to read about you know, submarine problems, but they might watch a video. <laughs> you know? So, so there's, a, there's a really a, an odd thing about uh, the learn, what constitutes the learning. And by the way, there's one, one extra thing, by the way, and that is the, any of these may have been, in my mind, um, might have been even more powerful if one of them allowed you to ask questions. If each of them is simply presentation only, oh, that's a really mm -hmm. odd way to yeah. learn, right? No, what if I could true. ask you yeah, a clarification a question? Yeah, <laughs> so, so this, is, this is where I think it's combinations of things. 
And, and anyway, basically, that's my thought is that it, you can get too detailed in things. You'd find out that learning about atomic energy is great in VR, but learning about uh, Earth isn't. <laughs> I mean, that's odd. Well, uh, so, so let me answer this. I, you know, I, um, I like that you brought up the Anne Frank house because it's <laughs> an emotional experience. And uh, under presence, I would put emotionality and empathy. And then I skip over all that, don't I? Like I give it short shrift. So I sort of wanted to put that up front that because I'm interested in STEM, I don't do a lot with emotion and presence. And I think that going through the Anne Frank house gives you, well, I've only been in, in real life, uh, not in VR, but I think it does give you this sense of like, oh my God, these people like hid in the attic and it's pretty intense. So there are things that can be learned in a spatial VR experience that are emotional that I don't touch on at all here. And, um, yeah, I mean, look, your point is taken about that. I'm also also only focusing on this sort of declarative knowledge, and you can learn that with, with flashcards. But why why would you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I think that we've got a lot of opportunities, and I'm going to guess also that I don't mean to uh, grab everything here, but um, the different people learn different ways. I mean, I'm in software development, and I have trained any number of people, and some people don't get it. And I'm not sure that they don't get it. I'm sure that I haven't thought of the right way to get it into their brain. Right. Just <laughs> as long as you don't say visual and verbal learners, because we know that's been we're, that's been disabused. There's no such thing as a visual learner or a verbal learner. It's like everyone can learn. The content might be uh, might be presented better in a visual or verbal format, but there's no such thing as learners who only learn in one different one specific way. So, I always have to make sure to say that. But yeah, th things yeah. should be pre represented in multiple ways. Yeah. Thanks. Another question? Uh, I have a question. I can sort of hear you. Maybe if you that shout. That? Yeah, that's better. Yes, um, I can. Yeah, so you've, you've prevented so much wonderful quantitative research today. And uh, it seems like you have a lot of experience in the field, and I'd love to just hear uh, one of your qualitative moments where you saw uh, a participant uh, really, something really quick for them uh, learning through VR. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um... Well, I mean, isn't it so fun to see their little faces light up when you put the headset on them? Like, you can't see their eyes, but they smile and they're into it. And so the game we made, you know, you're moving your body and you're looking at these beautiful butterflies. And, like, the kids just start to walk forward and, and move their hands around and try to capture them in, in the net. And they're just into it. So into it in a way that they're not when they're reading a book. Like, if you're reading a book about the wing pattern changes like it's just not the same thing as being you know taking on the role of a zookeeper and catching these butterflies so i just you know i can see that their face and their bodies sort of light up as they learn and um you know another thing that we like to do as experimental psychologists is give a, a straw man condition like a reading condition right but i didn't even bother with that because i know they're going to learn more on a pc which is also a pretty and fun looking game even though it's 2d versus the the VR and so if I have them like just reading text like a book about you know mimicry it's it's just yeah I know they're not going to learn as much or be as excited or be as engaged so I sort of like seeing that aha moment and um yeah I'm sure we've all sort of seen that I see Thanks. a question up there Bill S. Guess the moderators are, open you up. You're next. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to go on megaphone. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, that, first of all, thank you for the presentation. I, too, appreciate quantitative testing and so on. Um, I work in Virginia. I run a, a computer club. and. One of the projects we just did in 2018, 2019 was work with the National Park Service to develop a virtual reality sim of the Grand Canyon for the centennial. And oh, very I think, cool. oh yeah, and talk about spatial reasoning, we did it on the rift. Yeah. But the really cool thing we did was um, we, we worked in Unity and we mapped the Y axis to the elevation on the rift uh, in the canyon. 
So we were able to map all the formations. So as you're flying around uh, the Grand Canyon, uh, it's displaying uh, things like the geology, the formations, the geologic age, what kind of fossils are there. I've, I've actually gone down in the canyon, and I think I learned more flying around. Uh, it was a very similar experience because you do get that sense of spatial, um, the magnitude of the canyon, but you also get to learn a lot about the geology. We're also doing it with history sims. We just did one on Selma, Alabama, where kids built Selma, Alabama, and the bridge, and you're actually walking under the bridge like you were uh, a civil war, uh, one of the African-American archers there. So you get a very uh, sort of gut feeling about what it was like to cross the bridge, and would you want to do it? You can ask what if questions. I mean, it just seems like there's so many possibilities with virtual reality, and we're just doing it on a computer. Your, yeah. your thoughts on well, that? Yeah, I do have two questions for you, actually. And one is, um, when you're flying around the Grand Canyon, like, are you worried about the velocity of the person? Because, I mean, you know, when we made the butterfly game, we thought about you being a bird and swooping down and capturing the butterflies. And then it would, the idea was like, no, that's just going to make you nauseous. And I've been on magic carpet type things, and it's just, it's not fun. So I made this very sensitive to the proprioceptive system where you're just standing still and moving your arm. Um, so I was nervous to make people fly. So if you had any problems with that. No, nope, haven't. In fact, uh, we can control the speed. Basically, I create, we create our own first-person controller. So we were able to put in, we can put in uh, variables to control the speed with which you're going up and down the y-axis. The big one but is can turn. The, per the person can control, but the person can control it as well, right, or no? Right, yes. Uh, basically, yeah, 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 we, that's good. We mapped, the, uh, we mapped the going up and down to the trigger buttons on the rift control. Yeah. Um, but I'm saying we can but do you it cap it so that they can't go too fast, that you cap it. Yes. Right? Actually, the yeah, big thing sense. we found was the turning speed was what was really making people nauseous. Um, uh -huh, that makes so we sense too. Yeah. yeah, so we had to cap that and slow it down on uh, some of the simulations. Yeah, and the other thing about so Selma is... Yeah. It, the other thing about Selma is that it's it's a wonderful example what you said about the... Um, the empathy and the, the presence. And, you know, I mean, one thing I want to caution people who are doing history is, like, just make sure you don't traumatize the students, right? Like, it's yeah. so intense. So, Well, that's, yeah, that, just, we had a discussion of that. I talked to the history teachers, and I said, with you can do this multiplayer. You can actually have um, where you can pick up clubs and have people hit each other virtually. They right? can't physically harm them. The, teach, the teachers drew the line there and said, no, we're yeah, just going to no, go no. with historical no, footage. No, that makes me yeah. nervous, too. Yeah, that's yeah, just like, yeah. yeah I'm just saying yeah. it's interesting what's possible with technology as to what we should be doing. Super interesting. Maybe we need, like, an ethics board, like a rubric for ethics of, of VR for education because... I, you know, I could see a parent being very upset if a kid comes home. I have two kids, and they said, oh, today I took a club and beat, you know, someone in VR. It's just, sure, it'd be fun, but is it right? <laughs> like, you know, when I got my first bullet in super hot, I was like, oh, my God, I don't like this at all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another question. Uh, actually, so now we will have to uh, switch to the next speaker. So everyone, please give me the... Uh, one last round of applause. Thank you, guys. This was fun. Appreciate it. See you again, and, hopefully. And Mina, if you wanted to continue answering some questions, we have a portal in the back over here. And okay. if you follow that and anyone Good. in the audience wanna... who still wants to talk with her, you can go ahead, go to the portal, which should go to our social lounge. Otherwise, next up, we And stay will in have... here, the next speaker as well. That'll be great. Yep. Our next speaker will be coming up very shortly. So sit tight, everyone. The portal. <laughs> oh, Mina, we have a portal uh, in the back over here. So you don't have to open another new one. Oh, the back, this way. Boom. Right over here where I'm standing, everyone. 
So go ahead and walk into that portal and you should teleport into Social Dodge. You're about to teleport, okay. Another note. Yeah. To get with us right away. Is he still here? Uh, um, I'm here. Yep, he should yeah, still here. be here. Where is he? I don't see him. There's Eric Hawkinson. Oh, Where? hey, Eric. Uh, you're muted right now. You can oh, unmute yourself by is. clicking on the menu. And uh, there's a mic button there. He just messaged me with his slides, Michael, or his uh, bit information, but it's on my screen. How do I uh, save that so I can paste it in? Are you able to, click, like, you're not I able to copy, copy it? No. Um, hang on. Hello, are you, can I'll, you I hear me? Probably Hello? just type it in. Okay. What do you hey, think? Eric, so, Eric, you're still muted. If you go to your menu on the bottom left of your screen, there should be a button that looks like a little microphone. If you click that, it will unmute yourself so we can hear you. If you can see the microphone button, shake your head up and down. Okay. And when you're clicking on it, it's not unmuting you. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm going to try to figure out. Eric, are you on like an Oculus Rift or some other like PC VR device? Okay. Hmm. All right, let's see. Ta -da -da. Can you, um, Eric, do you know how to re-enter the space? <clears throat> To your settings, try that and then come back in. Hello, hello, testing my mic. It's working just fine in my own space. It's a permissions issue. Now I'm going to go back. Um, can you message me the link on Discord? I'll figure out something really fast. What's, my, Michael, what's your telephone number? I could... Um... Okay. Michael? Yep. You want me to send you the, um... Send me the link. That's, I'm trying to do that. Oh, is that him? Oh, yeah. Can he just send it to you? Because all I've got is a picture of it. Okay. Eric, can you message me your link right now? Because I couldn't copy it from my instant messages. Uh, he'll have to do it. 
Okay. Eric, can you send Michael the link? Because I can't copy it. As are on stage, I can't click on you, Michael. That's not Michael. Eric, so in terms of your audio issue, oh, yeah, let me try seeing that. Okay. Thank you, that did it. Thank you. Okay, Yay. cool. Okay, Eric, so we're back. So, Eric, can you message me your slides? Eric, you need that's Eric? Hello? Yes, hello. <laughs> Eric, can you hear me? Okay, you need to email the link to Michael, please. Okay. Did you hear that? Yeah, I heard it. Just give me a second. Awesome. Thank you. I just want to make sure I go out and re-enter just in case. Hey everyone, we're currently trying to fix the slides. Hang tight and we'll get started shortly. Uh, Eric, were you, okay, so are you messaging me right now? You can also email it to our educators in VR email or Discord, any method would work right now. Okay, thank you. Are you all enjoying the conference? I just unmuted everyone because we still got five minutes. So feel free to talk a little bit for now. I'm just going to keep working on some stuff.
Have you all enjoyed the sessions you've been to so far? Yes? Yes, yes, they've been wonderful. And I unmute everybody. Great. Okay, I was trying to, oh, there you go. Now I've unmuted everybody. Donna, you should be able to control the slides now. Uh, clicking on the screen. Uh, okay. Okay. Want to do that test just so we know it works? Okay. And. Uh, yeah, you click right on the screen to the test bar. Should be like right here. Uh, okay, right here, here, here. I don't see anything like that. If you hover your mouse over the screen, there should be a little taskbar that shows up on the bottom left. Ah, I do now. Thank you. Okay, so if you click next, let me know when that happens. Okay, is that the far arrow? There you go. Okay. Yep. Okay, everyone in the audience, if you saw the slides change. Okay, let me do this. And I've got his introduction. Emoji. Let me get back to the start slide. Okay, Diamond, I think okay. you should be all good. There's there still three minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's still okay. three minutes before the huh. event actually Whoops. starts. How'd that happen? Okay. I got to get back to... Wait a minute, I'm trying to get, there we go. Okay, we're on slide number one. Oh, what, <laughs> I think we're both controlling it. There you go. Eric, can you control the slides yourself? Why does it keep moving? Are you? Oh, I see Eric, what's please? happening. When I click, I get, yes, I, I see that. Anymore. Okay, I've learned something new today. Yep. Okay, that means that I can't turn around there. Okay. Gotcha. I am good to go. And I am going to introduce Eric if he's ready. Eric Diamond, you ready? I'm ready when you are, anytime. Can everyone hear my voice? Eric, I'll let you tell me when you're ready to go and we'll do it. Everyone can hear me, or sounds like. Right, everyone in the audience can hear me. Is that correct? Awesome. You're breaking up, Michael. Let me see. Do I need to go out and come back in? Uh, you should be good. And then okay. Eric, can you talk right now? I just need to go to the audience. Oh, this is so frustrating. <laughs> I'm sure okay, after three days of uh, slight technical problems, you must be getting really tired of them by now. <laughs> um, hello? Yeah, I mean, like, testing, I'm testing, one, two, three. Eventually. I'm talking into the mic. Let's see if everyone can hear me. Good for me. I'm just waiting for Donna or Diamond to get back. Okay. Okay, slides are loading, and we're good. Eric, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, okay, let me introduce you to the group. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Eric Hawkinson, 
founder of Orientation. After five years of developing augmented reality educational materials, Eric Hawkinson, founder of Orientation, an augmented reality platform geared towards learning and engagement. The platform allows less technically inclined students and teachers to create and share AR experienced content and environments. So with that, please let's welcome Eric Hawkinson. Yay. I do my Fozzie Bear. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and Eric, if you'll tell me when you're ready to leave the slide to advance, that'd be awesome. Thank you very much, and thanks and all for all of your hosting your... efforts and all of this. It's been, I know with the technical <laughs> difficulties, it's slightly getting more irritating, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> Uh, just to let you know, I'm live streaming too, so if you're um, going to be able to watch this um, later, if you wanted to too. My name's Eric Charles Hawkinson. Please call me Eric. Um, I'm based in Japan. Someone's raising their hand over there. A host could get with that one. Um, oh, I'm into class. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Mila? Is that Mila? Hi, Mila. Yes, that's me being ignorant. Sorry. <laughs> um, can we just go to the next slide and I'll just uh, talk a little bit about uh, the context of what we're, what we're doing today. Next slide, please. Should I do it myself? No, can't do it myself. It's um, just after lunch here in Japan and oh, there it goes. That's a, that, up, up there behind me, that just looks way too big with my big tummy. <laughs> anyway, I'm based in Japan. Um, actually, I grew up in Arizona, so me now, um, I'm an ASU undergrad, so it's great to see an, two oh, people sharing cool. the same uh, um, session from Arizona. Uh, but I came to Japan a little less than 20 years ago. I had a background in IT. Now I teach, and of course, those worlds combined. And behind me are some of the where I spend my kind of passion and, um, and uh, professional efforts. My day job is at uh, Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, where I teach classes related to IT and tourism, digital literacy, things like that. Um, I head up a special interest group here in Japan. We have about 40 members all doing different stuff around immersive learning and mostly in higher ed. We have some developers and indie gamers in our group as well. There's a big indie gamer community here in Kyoto, where I live. Um, and that's where my TEDx Kyoto stuff comes in. I do a lot of volunteer work in TED. I'll talk a lot about how I'm working to integrate immersive technology with the TED platform and my own passion project, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, uh, called Orientation, um, just orientation with just the AR slant and um, kind of give us some stories of development over the past oh, six, seven years or so, and sort of talk about some of the issues, the um, problems, the development, both commercially and research-wise, as I talk about some of these stories. Ahead, next slide, please. Maybe I can do it. Ooh, I can do it. Right, so I'm going to set the stage with kind of like a wide vision of my interpretation of immersive learning and um, what it means. And then I'm going to dive into some uh, stories of developing different stuff over the next couple of years. And then I'll try to bring it home with like a where are we going, what does it all mean, double rainbow type um, um, message at the end. So I see immersive learning in the context of every step along the way of technology that we've used learning for, right? So it's great to think that we have, we're on this next stage, going up to this next level in using some sort of new technology, new medium for which to learn and teach and communicate. And every step along this path that we've gone through has sort of get, given the groundwork for the story that we might be heading into and are heading into in the next realm of immersive media, new media, uh, augmented XR, and all the names that we're giving it these days. Can I the next slide, please? 
Maybe I can make it right. I don't know. So, <laughs> this is actually to tell you where I am right now. I'm in my lab, and if you could see, is this video showing for everybody? Is this going okay? Great. I'm jealous. Um, so, just to see where I'm actually standing right now. Oh, boy. Came and went. There it goes. I'll control my own slides if that's okay. I think I think that might be easier. Um, so this is great, right? So we're, this is a mixed reality environment. I've got a green screen in the back. I'm projecting myself into a, a virtual space. And I am using the 3D environment to talk about the Apollo moon landing and how what the trajectory they made and where they might have landed on the moon. And I even do these lessons about talking about spatial acuity and um, four dimensions and all that fun stuff just to just for my own personal fun <laughs> but this is an example of just where, where I am and what I'm doing now right <clears throat> so we are in VR space and we're talking a lot about VR and VR research um, in this conference, but uh, a lot of the stuff that I've been concentrated on is the mix of these things and what we do and how we act when we in, when we go between virtual, real world, and somewhere in between. And uh, things like Pokemon Go or um, a simple uh, act of connecting digital things to real things and real people around you. And so um, most p researchers know this continuum, Milgram's continuum. And it started to give a framework to how we're calling these things um, between real world and virtual world. Right now, we're mostly in a virtual environment. But I think as learning designers, and this is a lot of stuff I take a lot of time thinking about, is when we start to design learning content or curriculum or what have you, is where on this spectrum we want to be and why and what's the best case use for that type of environment do we want to go all digital is it stuck hmm? i think we're doing okay are we frozen <laughs> um okay folks let's what is this somebody having an issue um eric is your video set to autoplay it's not showing it's not i'm not showing a video right now can I reset the space? I'm not showing a video right now. I don't think we need to reset unless there's somebody in the audience that wants to. <laughs> I'm seeing all types of crazy face, sad face. <laughs> just go ahead and see if you can move it. Eric. Did you want me to do it? I'm gonna just go to the next slide. Everybody see the next slide? <laughs> I think I think we're doing okay. Excuse me, Eric. Eric, it's Donna. Um, your voice is picking up quite a bit. Do you mind if we just do a quick um, reset of the space? That might just help your voice because it's kind of choppy for people. All right. It'll take ten seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sorry about that, Eric. Let me just. Slides are gone. Yeah, I noticed. Can you try okay, your audio from you here? Uh, testing my audio. I'm currently talking into my mic to test the audio. Testing the audio still. I hear you. I can, I can see him. 
Okay. I'm just going to reset these slides over here. It's much better. Well, no, it was. Just give me a second. I'm just putting in, I'll take care of this. Hey, Eric, give me one second. So we have to publish your slides to the web. So I'm just going to put in the copy that we have of your slides and it should be working. This is one of the little details of Vault Space. Oh, I see. Okay, so now I am refreshing the slides. Okay, are you able to control the slides? Looks like I can. Okay, then let's go with that then. How are we doing now? Everybody back with me? Can you can hear my voice? See my, see the slides? Thanks guys. Sorry for the hiccup. <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so my research group uh, that I mentioned before, based in Japan, they're doing uh, tons of. That looks like the link to the unpublished deck. <laughs> they're doing a bunch of. No, posts. that's better. Yeah, yeah, the first one we saw was in. I'm gonna mute, mute Diamond with my, I think I have some host panel here. I don't have the permissions to do that. Oh, there it goes, speeded. Okay. Um, we have researchers from all over the world in our group, and they're doing all these wonderful things, and uh, I'm ex really excited, and of course a lot of people here are, about how we're connecting different immersive tools for learning for all these wonderful things and how we're getting benefit from them. Um, I wanted to ask the question before to Mina, uh, because um, I'm running into a couple of roadblocks, and after developing stuff for the past, oh, between five and 10 years, I've run into a bunch of issues uh, around privacy, um, the automation and collection of information for the purposes of automation and the psychological effects of overuse or use that we see in the mobile world starting to translate into um, the immersive space. I'll talk a little bit about more as I go through. So um, I'd like to go through some of the projects of the last 10 years or so and kind of have that inform uh, the overall concept of how uh, we should or hopefully be using different sets of values, making immersive platforms moving forward. And so I have these couple of early projects where I started prototyping stuff. Um, this couple of new, this first series around 2010, 2011, I was, uh, when I first came to Japan, I started as an English teacher and moved into teaching uh, English at a university. And so I made my own textbook for to teach English to Japanese learners. And I started a English language um, site for tourists coming to Japan to, to give more information about sort of the lesser known areas of Japan, living in the countryside, less touristy information where you couldn't find those information in English. And those have kind of evolved uh, as the technology has evolved over the past years. And so what I first did, I started developing eBooks uh, 2007, 2009, right when the iPhone first came out in Japan. And I, around 2010, I started noticing that all the stuff I was creating for eBooks, like videos and interactive elements and quizzes, and was um, all, 
I had to create contents to put them in an ebook, but I had other contents already published in textbooks. So one of the first obvious things was to take a textbook that was already available and redesign it using augmented reality with the rationales that we can use existing information a textbook and just enhance it with digital contents, uh, virtual settings, virtual worlds, um, quizzes, videos, what have you, and started connecting that to that. So I took one of my classes, took my English textbook, and I sort of did a quick redesign. Um, it's sort of the design process is much like trying to, it's half web design, half print design, and a little bit of UI UX that you started to kind of think about during this process. So like there's a, there's a lot of white space on this page down here, right? <clears throat> And so I was going to fill that up with buttons. This is using an app, um, I believe, which is still available, but it's not very popular anymore, called Lyar. Um, and so I started experimenting with this right away and started using the design functions of it to see what I could do with it as an educator. And I quickly started to realize that where this is most popular is not just connecting the contents in the textbook, but around the, the university, around the campus. So I took these triggers, when you need to argue eventually, you have two things, you have a trigger and an overlay, and putting them all over campus. It's around 2014, 2015, and I started to put announcements, connect uh, contents that we were doing in class to physical places around campus. And then I started to use the student's location to inform the contents that they were getting. So. You look at your textbook with an augmented reality app on campus, you see different stuff than when you're at home. So I, I locked contents to if they were physically on campus or at home. And I even got to kind of track, started to track students of where they were uh, taking in elements of uh, these augmented things inside of the textbook. And this was very informative. So, so this is right around the time, maybe a year and a half later, Pokemon Go came out. That inspired a couple other new evolutions of this as well. Right, so this first kind of prototypey four or five years, um, there's a bunch of like design concerns that I came out of this, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I'd like to kind of first talk about um, the internet connectivity bandwidth issues and aspect ratios, um, because uh, actually Mina talked about some of the cognitive overload stuff in the last talk too, that was very interesting. But um, bandwidth was a supreme issue uh, and still is when you ask, when you, when you have a BYOD situation, we have students coming in using their own devices and having the digital contents, whether it be virtual contents and something like cardboard or augmented contents like I was creating this app in class, it's very bandwidth intensive and Connectivity was a must. Uh, if I had them moving around campus, I couldn't guarantee that Wi-Fi would be available to them. And so I had to start to design around those issues. Talking about aspect ratios, right? This is gonna come in later when I uh, re-upped and made my own application, is that when you're augmenting space, both in a virtual space and a real space, that the aspect ratios need to match for each. So for, if you can imagine, there's a big screen behind me and I want to overlay or augment that uh, with some other digital contents. If the aspect ratios are not in alignment, that's both confusing and not very aesthetically not pleasing. And <clears throat> so this, these are some of the new things that I learned in these early stages of development in this, this process, in the, in the design process. Right, so next step. Um, in this process, I'm starting to develop my own application. I want a grant for the Ministry of Education in Japan to start developing some contents. I contracted with a company in Matayo who went out of business because they got bought by Apple. This is a very common story in my whole, the whole development issue of using these technologies is uh, there's new business models and new acquisitions and patent efforts. And so during, especially even now, but even more especially four or five years ago, it was difficult to get something that was fairly static that I could develop on for a, a long-term research project. So I started developing my own app, and this is one of the first case uses I did with it. 
It's called Before I Graduate or the Big Project. And the goal was to <coughs> sort of create an augmented community art space. And this is, goes back to my c connections with Ted. And this is inspired by uh, Candy Chang, which did a TED talk called Before I Die, where she was taking these, uh, sorry, these types of abandoned houses in New Orleans and then making them into collaborative uh, community spaces where people could write messages of what they wanted to do before they die. And so I took this as inspiration and made my own kind of augmented version of this. And so we created a wall on campus. Students created short messages and wrote on a wall of some wish, some goal, some aspiration they'd like to do before they graduate. And with an application, they took a picture and did a one or two minute video testimonial about this wish or hope or dream. And this app connected their videos to their message on a wall. So if you can see up here on the top right um, is a, this first prototype wall and students are just writing quick messages on it and slapping a sticker, which is a augmented reality trigger, which students could view videos. And then uh, first they'd see a message. They'd see if that message resonated with them, if they wanted to see more about that particular message, watch the video. And then the app allowed them to connect with each other uh, via email or text message and kind of cheer each other on. So this became like a shared augmented space uh, through augmented reality. And so I kind of drew from this from the locationality that was afforded from the earlier textbooks designs I did earlier. So now, um, from that, I, that set of playing cards and that concept, I then started developing my own application um, with the goal of making an open source, free to use, privacy by design place for teachers because I personally was very frustrated with um, the current situation because usually free stuff is very data hungry and for using this especially with school children is not so cool and then also we had the the proprietary wars or walled garden type situations happening with my story uh, trying to get stuff developed and having it be bought and resourced by big big companies so um, I didn't never set out to be a developer but this is it and although it's not the most perfect streamlined product out there it's got hits all those button points where it's easy to use simple design and it's free and it's not going to overly collect data about anyone who uses it you can find that at orientation or at the app stores of your choice so what it is it's a very simple concept it's a set of playing cards and it it what it does is it makes the triggers decided so you a lot of what's designing into augmented reality worlds is deciding the trigger and getting that programmed into your app or program or computer vision algorithm to have it recognized. So we have a set of playing cards that are optimized for computer vision algorithm so the, the app can distinguish between them and recognize them easily and just put them in the hands of students. And then I use the Google API to connect them with a Google form. And everyone's filled out a Google form. How many of you here have actually filled out a Google form? You've probably filled out one this week, right? <laughs> right? So all you have to do is go onto a Google form and say, card one, stream this YouTube video. Card two, show this website. Card three, play this audio link. Card four, show this 3D model. It's kind of smart in that sense. So all you have to do is tell students, give, give them a set of playing cards, give them a link to a Google form. And from this co very simple concept, we're spawning all types of new crazy projects around learning and teaching and tourism, etc. Right, so right around the Pokemon Go era, um, we upped the game on this and we had a VR AR rally. Um, we had our entire freshman class um, in our school of tourism. There's about 200 incoming students. We had 50 upperclassmen helping and a variety of faculty and staff as well. And we also invited members of the community to get involved and we sent students 
uh, as part of their orientation all over the city to different kind of um, challenges and activities and uh, quests all around the city with the goal of getting students engaged with the community. So this is around a community engagement project, a pro, uh, school. And so what you're seeing now is a video for the local library that's d downtown and they come in, they see one of the cards and they get a mission. And that mission is please uh, go up the stairs, take this specific route up to the uh, top floor and while you're doing it please take mention of the things written around you and on this particular library there is a a history of the city and prefecture of this particular town written on the walls and so what I've done with using the augmented reality I've used the triggers to overlay English content on top of the Japanese content that was written on the walls so these are Japanese students that are just coming out of high school. They have different levels of language ability. This is a little bit of language learning that I've kind of put into this using the augmented reality. So what they do is when they get up to the top floor, there's a box there with a bunch of locks on it and a cipher, which is also an augmented reality. And they have to insert the dates of different historical events around the city to open the box. And in the box, there's another card with another trigger that gives a video of congratulating the students and where they need to go next on this grand adventure. And one of the great affordances about this type of activity is you get to include the physical environment. Um, some of the quests actually had uh, students finding a physical person and asking them questions. And it was really a great kind of team building exercise and also kind of a welcome to the city, get to know everything, get to know how things are used at the same time as well. Right, so now we're getting to kind of an upper level of design concerns, concerns of using this technology for learning purposes, and that is ethical and legal issues. Um, with this particular upgrade of my app, I am now tracking every student that has downloaded that app and their movements around the city, uh, where they're triggering things. Um, some students were taking snapshots, I found out later, of cards and uh, sending them to friends and triggering them in places where I knew that that card wasn't. So I kind of found out some that students were actually kind of hacking the system a little bit in this way too. But there's all these issues that uh, came about during this whole process. And uh, the city uh, brought up some issues as far as well, getting permissions to use videos in AR. Like they don't they didn't want things on the web, but I, it's very difficult for me to explain to them going through the AR process that it's locked in the card and you can only view it through an app. But still, uh, I couldn't tell them or point them to any legal precedent that allowed me to use this type of material or copyright or video or et cetera in this type of environment. So, and, um, so there's issues with tracking and data collection. There's issues with privacy. There's issues with intellectual property and all types of other issues that I started to run into. And a lot of these things we also learned from the Pokemon Go era that was happening around the same time. All right, so here's just a quick demo of the app and how it works. So just set a bunch of cards out on the table. You look at a card, you can see video, web, um, sound, anything, any digital contents you can connect to a card and then that stuff gets put um, into the, the application. So you can look view this through your, when you look view, view things through your smartphones, things get augmented in very quick and easy way. So I filled out my, my Google form. Video one was a YouTube link, so it knew that was a YouTube link and it started streaming a YouTube video. This link is just a website where it's asking a question and creating a word cloud etc etc so there's just with a simple concept um, that first Pujama AR rally was sort of like the first wide-scale use or practice that I tried to use using this this this, this type of uh, platform okay 
So now I'm going to show you a series of projects that we're currently still doing. And I'm hoping if anybody in the audience finds any of these interesting, you actually have the opportunity, if you want, to actually get involved with the current set of projects that I'm going to show you now. Um, we have a school of tourism at our university, and we're having, we have a tourism, starting to have a tourism issue in Japan. We're getting the Olympics this year, and for the past four years, we've had record numbers of international tourism in Japan, especially where I live in Kyoto City, it's one of the cultural centers of Japan. And there's a lot of cultural norms and language issues and other uh, traditional type aspects of Kyoto that don't meld with this larger global community. So there's a lot of work being done around tourism and the, the exponential growth uh, that's happening around tourism in Japan is a concentration issue. A lot of people are going to the same places at the same times. So this is a project that's connected to the uh, Forever Kyoto that I started uh, 10 years ago, but it's just an immersive form. So what's happening here is students are learning how to create, curate, design, and actually give tours in virtual reality. And so what they're doing for, for their first attempt at this is that they're creating hometown tours, so something they know a lot of about. And so what I'm asking them to do is actually create personal stories that connect to their place that they come from. So like uh, they, you get shown, if you're going on a, one of these students tours, you don't, you might see like some historical uh, artifact in their city, but you mostly hear stories like this is the park where I met my best friend and we used to play hopscotch here, et cetera, et cetera. So what this is trying to do is connect personal stories to all these less traveled places around Japan and connect people as well. So that's what the concentration issue has. We want to connect lesser known places and people together and not necessarily the, the hottest tourist attractions. So these are openly available on a database uh, online and you can go on and start to kind of take these personalized tours and these students are getting actually real world experience designing, curating information and giving guided tours in English, by the way, which is um, a good practice for them for when they go out and do this in their careers. Students are taking this and making their own hunts. So last year, um, we had the cuffs go with Kyoto University of Foreign Studies, right? So uh, a group of students, we have this traditional tour when students come about how to use the library and so two students created a narrative. One is a cop, a police officer, and the other is a, uh, a hacker, uh, a robber, whatever you want to call him. And so you come into the library, there's one of those augmented reality orientation cards, and it loads up a bit for the first as a video and you get shown like, oh my God, thank God you're here. I'm the chief of police. We've just had an incident at the library. Uh, I need your help and then you get given some hints and clues and then from that hint and clue you go to the next location you learn something you do something uh, you look something up in next and next and next and next and through this I think eight to nine step process you learn what's in the library how to look up a periodical how to get yourself a DVD and use the video room and etc 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 so it's kind of like a gamified orientation orientation of the the area and this is all designed by students and i gave them probably a two or three week um lead uh course leading up to that and i let them go for about six weeks and then we had about four or five weeks to test out with other students in the class for, for this particular project so it's all done in one uh 15 week term this, this whole thing. So it was, I'm very pleased with the fact that the design of this orientation project is getting to the point where students are actually able to jump in with design ideas and start actually using it without spending a whole lot of time in development. And so you remember the Before I Graduate project? Um, that has been iterated on as well. And so I created a a kind of like a template, a wall 
and these walls are being put in different locations around Kyoto and there's two of them on our campus in Kyoto, the Kyoto University of Foreign Studies. And so we can have a centralized place to have these kind of shared uh, environments. Um, so the Before I Graduate project is still being continued by some students at our university and they're connecting their personal stories and wishes and dreams to these walls. The back side of the wall is a green screen so students is yet also um, you put some signs around giving students instructions about what to do, or what kind of video to make, what, how to participate. They can take out their smartphone take a quick video right then and there and have that connected permanently to that physical space. So we're starting to experiment with different types of shared um, augmented spaces using this, this, this type of uh, environment. The latest one is called the Why Me Project. And um, I've been rolling this out to different schools all around Asia. The latest school to, to participate in this one is a um, K-12 International School in South Korea. Uh, there's, a there's a school in Thailand working on this and a couple of schools also in Japan. Um, it's making personal catchphrases and talking about who they are and why they are, kind of like a dig deep and share who you are type of, type of project. And then they get randomized with different students from around the world. So when you go up to this wall, not only do you see students in your physical location, but you can see randomized messages from different students around the world. And the app will allow you to uh, connect with them further if you wanted to, right? It's called the Why Me Project. TechComs is a, an experiment that I'm doing to kind of see what the affordances are of going from a virtual space to a mixed reality space, to an augmented space, to a real space. So um, has anybody in the audience tried Breakout EDU? Breakout EDU, anybody? No? I'm seeing a lot of nods. Okay, so let me quick explain that. It's the escape room um, phenomenon, the escape room concept, but instead of getting a bunch of students in a room and locking them in and having them try to escape, work together to escape the escape room, it's a box and that box has locks on it. And so you put a box in front of a group of learners, it could be kids, it could be adults, and you give them a set of instructions and their goal is to, as a group, open that box. And so I have a video game that I've, uh, RPG video game that I've made. I have a VR tour that, that students have made and I have my orientation project. And so what I'm trying to do is have students jump into VR jump into a, a virtual environment, use augmented reality to get videos, 3D models, um, sort of an augmented right of, and in the real world, getting students to actually face-to-face -face have interactions with each other and sort of kind of play with jumping between these levels that I showed you before, between the Milgram's virtuality continuum. And it's been working pretty great. I've got uh, four different missions on this tech comms. It's all about teaching uh, kids and adults about the progression of communication technology that I showed the first slide. So it's a little bit of meta stuff going on, right? Uh, learning the, the uh, effects and challenges we had when we were getting print uh, going, the printing press and radio and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, kind of like a mission that where we go through time and learn about the, the evolution of technology and communication and how that affected society. Okay. Um, everybody okay on time? I'd like to try to put a bow on this. These are all the latest projects, so I'm hoping we uh, give you some uh, abilities to, com you have the ability to participate in any of those projects uh, if you contacted me. Um, and I'd be happy to help facilitate any of those type of activities at your schools uh, if you should so see it. So how is this going to happen moving forward? So you see, like, in the last 10 years, I went from prototyping, working with some design issues, growing at scale, work, working out some legal and ethical issues, and now trying to see where this is all going. And then now I'm trying to see what the what's the possible downsides that are going to might be happening and using trying to have some foresight 
to see those possible downsides so we can mitigate the downsides and and um, bring out some of the more positive benefits that I shared with you earlier. And so there's four main things that I would like to think about to help us kind of usher in this new type of environment, especially if you're wanting to design a platform like I did for the facilitation of learning. And one is the move to empathic computing, the integration of AI, the ubiquity of all this, and business models that are happening around this, this technology. Right, so look at us and all in VR. This is crazy uh, in my mind because um, when I, usually when I go out and give a public talk, um, I have to sign a bunch of forms saying um, I give up intellectual property rights to my slides and my voice and whatever and they can be used by the the host in perpetuity for whatever when I do research I have to sign an agreement uh, sign my sign my life over and to allow the company to publish my work in any way they see fit but in this environment not only am I required to do that but you as audience members are required to do this as well this whole area is being tracked every one of you is creating a plethora and multitude of data that is being used and curated for different means and so as we go up this the scale this um, uh, the the level of which data is being inputted to machines has different uh, outcomes and different things that might happen so as we start to move towards empathic computing uh, we're going to have to wrestle with a lot of these issues as well so um, just in the Google type of era right um, you, you say hey Google <laughs> I might just set off some phones but your voice is now being recorded now my gestures are being recorded so my physical uh, parameters can be inferred by my tracking data and now my mood can be I maybe have a bit bit, bit Fitbit that's connected all this other stuff and now we're getting into the Elon Musk thing where we're actually putting diodes on our face, EKGs, the last presenter talked about, and all this stuff has an, an impact on the, the threshold from which we can understand and control, actually, uh, people moving forward. All right, the integration of all this and the AI. So us using VR, we're actually helping to accelerate our society into AI because of the, what I just talked about and the the modality and the increased level of data that we're giving up or putting into the cloud and machines and machine learning through VR through AR um, we're helping to train AI systems that will help automate systems further so there's a reciprocal uh, you can call it a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle whatever you want to say but as we start to collect more data, then we're going to move up and store it faster, and then we're going to actually see it come back to us with better systems, and then we're going to go into the cycle, and it's going to accelerate further as we move forward. And we're putting it everywhere. So I have a screen three inches from my face. When, when I was young, my mom said, St don't sit so close to the TV. She would, she would be appalled to see me right now, I think, <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> But we, we're getting to the phone on the face era, and the, uh, my designs in augmented reality, um, Google with their Google Glass, they're coming out with new versions all the time. We have some social repercussions that we still need to kind of deal with move, with this moving forward, but it's easy to kind of predict that we're going to have more computers on our bodies, around us, in our environments, and the ubiquity of it all is going to also feed into the collection of data as well, and all those design and ethical and legal issues that I talked about earlier. So when we think about our students, and these are the things that I'm starting to think about more and more as my projects start to grow in scale and um, get more people involved, is the possible harms, possible dangers for augmented and virtual violence, especially in learning context. So uh, a couple of these were mentioned in various talks at this conference. Um, I won't go into all of them. Uh, maybe I'll just choose a couple of them. Um, let's talk about 
uh, the divided brain. That's a good one. So Pokemon Go in, in Japan, Pokemon Go is illegal. Um, at first it was legal to do Pokemon Go while driving. A couple people got killed. And now it's illegal to have your phone anywhere visible in your car uh, because we are dividing our brains between that uh, augmented environment, what's, what's in that space through the lens of our phones and what's really there. And this is starting to affect us in more ways that we actually realize. So we have, we each, ha we each have our, you people in this room and understand this more than most, I think, we each have our p person that we live outside and the person that we reflect or project in virtual spaces, like face, even things like Facebook and so on. So we're dividing not just our brain, but dividing our brain in ways for different situations, different contexts, and different places online. And students are actually benefiting from this in many ways, but also it's, uh, it, we don't, it might be hurting things like focus uh, and detail and things like that as well. The other thing I'll quick talk about is superficiality. Um, we have a bit of a crisis, uh, especially with young girls, uh, with the way that we project ourselves in in the mobile era that now it might be actually um, either helped a lot or even exacerbated in virtual and augmented contexts. Um, so we have students in my university, they don't put up a selfie unless they put it through a dozen filters. Make In Japan, it's very popular to make your eyes look bigger and rounder. And we're seeing that kind of double back into the real world because now we can augment this stuff in real time with augmented lenses so we can do this in video. And now it's even to the point where um, young girls in Japan are getting surgeries to look more like filters they see in their digital cells. So well, that stuff is being reflected back into real life and so that, that um, spectrum that I talked about earlier from the real and to the virtual is kind of shown in the superficiality um, in our societies, especially for young girls. All right, this is the, the last big thing I want to talk about because I think this encapsulates the whole concept of where this is heading in the future uh, as far as immersive learning and AR and VR and learning context is this idea of automating the process of which we inquire about the world, right? And I like to use the, the example of the botanist. So let's say I'm a botanist and I'm walking around some, I don't know, some forest and I, I see a, a flower and I have to ask myself a series of questions to help identify the species of that flower. What season is it? Uh, what's the weather been like lately? Is the climate, um, um, what elevation am I at, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now I can pull out a phone with an augmented reality lens on it, take a snapshot of that flower, have it upload to the cloud, and have it automatically compared and analyzed to millions of other photos of flowers all around the world. My phone knows where I am because it has GPS located on it from the tracking systems I talked about earlier and is able to take all those, ask all those questions for me and curate an answer right away. So um, I, the analogy also I like to use is when I was in elementary school, I got caught cheating with uh, reading the answers in the back of the book, right? You're going directly to the, to the answers in the back of the book with this type of learning, with this type of teaching. This is good. If you're not a botanist, you don't need to want, to want or think about those questions. You can free yourself up to think about, oh, this is a beautiful flower. I want to use it in my artwork. What species is it? I'll look it up later. But if you want to inquire and get that process of learning that t needs steps in the process of inquiry, we're starting to lose out on that. And that way makes, makes our devices could be more of a crutch than an actual tool in some ways. Um, we're already seeing this with our phones, right? We, we don't memorize phone numbers anymore because we can pull out our phone and look at the phone number. When we have what I'm calling the phone on the face era that's going to start happening this decade, uh, it's going to come with maybe some facial recognition software. You come up to a person that you're acquainted with, but you don't remember their name, but their name is going to be displayed over their face, right? Where it becomes more of a crutch 
and less of the um, opportunity. So there's opportunities here to learn what's going on in our environment, but there's also some dangers in the process from which we, the basic processes from which we teach and learn, and uh, that's happening around these, these, uh, these technologies. So moving forward, what do we do? We, as teachers, we have to elevate the concept of digital citizenship, being responsible contributors to a digital society. That's a lot of digital literacy. That's um, talking about the world as a community online. That's talking about privacy by design. That means um, a lot of business models. Shoshana Juboff talking about the surveillance economy, right? Give you stuff for free, take your data and monetize that in the form of ads or uh, targets and what, what have you. Um, and companies are making blanket user end agreements. <laughs> Altspace is no exception to that, to take everything that's happening in online and monetize that in some fashion. So the, the business models, privacy by design is gonna become very important if you are wanting to design these things for learning purposes and to protect people's data as well. And net neutrality is also based around this. So the idea of being able to overlay things on physical places, I've learned that it can also you can also trap information into pr physical places and things. And so you can actually um, kind of make a more of a digital divide with augmented reality if uh, you can say punish students that didn't go to the specific place at the specific time or didn't have the premium overlay to get the extra data content from that particular uh, scenario. So net neutrality is also very tightly connected to this. Oh boy. <laughs> I think I'm about done. Hopefully I didn't talk too long or bore you at all. My name's Eric, Eric Hawkinson. Uh, this is my line um, QR code. Uh, if you want to get involved or any of those projects that I mentioned, uh, please feel free to contact me because uh, I'm looking to uh, connect more students through the project that I talked about before. But most of all, thanks for listening. Thanks for taking the time to be here. and. Um, Hopefully we can connect at some point. Okay, I, Eric, thank you so much. And I think everybody could do a round of applause, big, huge applause for the excellent um, future that you've shown us that's going to happen in, in AR and um, our own realities going forward. I'm sure people have questions if you've got some time. Um, I put up a raise hand on your right hand side down below. So if you can click that, um, we will go to questions. Okay, first one is Freddles. Uh, I will give you the megaphone and ask your question, please. Hi, I was just wondering if um, slides are going to be available for us. Uh, yes, absolutely. Actually, you can re you could probably remember this if I just told you right now. I made a short link for this bit.ly slash immersive ed, all one word, bit.ly slash immersive ed. Um, or you can find, I'll put a link up on my website, erichawkinson.com. I'm very good about putting all of my research, all of my projects up online. So if you went to erichawkinson.com, you can find a link to all the my blog, which I blogged profusely about a lot of those projects that I talked about um, earlier in the slides. That's wonderful, thank you. And any other questions? Okay, I think, okay, got another question here, hang on. Okay, Christy, go ahead, I'll give you the megaphone. Hi, um, yes, thank you so much for sharing about your projects and everything you've done. Um, uh, this is kind of like a question slash brainstorm, but um, in thinking about the uh, wall that you had, um, I believe you were using um, AR orientation for that. Um, yes. But I was curious, uh, um, you said on the back side that there is a green screen. Um, if 
is it already done this way or do you think you would do it this way to where when the students go to the green screen um, if they actually recorded their video through the app um, it would automatically key out the green screen for them or how does your app how does your app uh, work with the keying? yeah it, that's exactly what's happening already right now um, what, what I found pretty powerful about the when I was talking about the aspect ratios before to having things melt meld with the augmentation with the actual physical card um, so now I built in automatic keying with into the app so if you're streaming a YouTube video or you upload a video with a green background it automatically gets keyed out and they look more like a hologram in that space on the wall yeah that's awesome very yeah, cool. it's, it's, it's much more I mean it just raises the, the level of immersion so much when it, it, if you don't have that 16 by 9 box right right Thanks, Christy. Okay. okay. And then, Tony, I'm going to give you the megaphone. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, Tony. Uh, hello. That was a fantastic talk, and I, and I want to do all, all the things that, that you mentioned there. <laughs> uh, um, so I, I did miss the first few minutes. I, I saw briefly that you were using tilt brush and mixed reality. Uh, with the green screen. I, I also do that for uh, teaching math in uh, Western Canada here. But uh, I, I'm, I'm just curious if uh, what platform you're, you're using for, uh, um, for, the, for the mixed reality portion. I, I was using Live and I'm, you know, for the same, for the reasons you were brought up here, uh, I'm a bit worried about sticking with, uh, you know, that company, for, for example, uh, just, just in case they get bought up by someone else and I can't use it anymore. Did you manage to get the mixed reality working without Live, or is that what you're using? Um, Live, yes. That's what I use mostly, and it is a free product, and um, they have one of those crazy long user end agreements as well, but it's hard to tell what they're doing with it. It's a black box, of course. Um, for that particular video, I was using Live, and the only other thing I have tried is um, Mixed Reality Solutions, I think it's called, and it's the only other thing that actually comes close for, that I've tried to offering what Live offers. Um, but and mm -hmm. my free trial version ran out, mm -hmm. and so I stopped mm -hmm. using that as well. So honestly, I I don't know of a great alternative right now for Live for a mixed reality environment. Uh, if you if you do, let's let's share it together. If anybody asks, will do. Well, thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, if not, um, Eric, if you w are willing to stay around for a little bit, maybe people could uh, ask you some questions in the social zone. We've got time, yay! Thank you, it's just, you're, the work you're doing is just amazing. Um, so, everybody, we've got some time now before our next session. There is a portal out by the stairs, um, that outside, it'll take you over to the social zone. and. I'm hoping Eric will have some time and be able to join us over there and we can socialize. So thank you very much. Eric, thank you again. Lots of kudos to you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for you all you're doing and... for the conference and uh, for the community. <laughs> oh, we're good to go. Thanks very much for hosting and all you're doing for the community. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, guys. I'm going to head over okay. to the portal for a little while. Thanks, Dalvara. You rock. I'll turn my megaphone off. And it's right this way. What is right what way? Just walk right into it and you will be on to the... Do 
I mean, are, is that you? Are, are you Lorel? Hi, have fun. Is that your real name, Lorel? I'm sorry. Is your are you Lorel? No, no, I could never measure up to Lorel. Um, I'm I'm Diamond, but okay. Lorel may be over in the social area. Okay. I just, I thought your voice reminded me of okay. hers, so I just asked, sorry if I made the mistake. Oh, what a, oh, no, what a compliment. You can call me Laurel any day. <laughs> just don't ask me to act. Oh, yeah, take the amount of responsibility. <laughs> All right, there we go. The man. Hey guys. Chozu, Sugoi. Arigato gozaimasu. Chotto atsukatta. You're the first one I saw that got the videos working in his presentation, so that, that's great. <laughs> I don't think I did anything yes, special. <laughs> it's just, um, I think what what's really cumbersome about this is. Um, having to host and have a camera and having a presenter on stage and actually, you know, cause you don't know what level of the presenter is of being able to control their own slides and what they're doing. And so you want someone controlling slides. So what was happening for me is like, they wanted to take control of what I was doing and for, they were having issues and they were interrupting yeah. me when I thought uh, everything was going okay. That was yeah. good for my end. Was that good for you guys? Yeah, it's good for my end, too. Tony, Christy, Peter, Georgina. Where are you, where are you, guys, where are you guys at? I already talked. Well, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry? Dallas. Dallas. Well, one Dallas more time. Fort Worth. Dallas, Fort Worth. Okay. Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. Cool. I was in... I was in uh, De Texas last March for South by EDU. That's the last time I was in Texas. Um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill here. Hey, all right. That was Christy there or Georgina? That was Christy. Uh, Christy, yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you got the primaries coming your way soon. <laughs> Uh, I guess so. <laughs> I just know it because uh, I'm a big fan of Dave Chappelle, and I think he's been doing some stuff there for the primaries. Also, um, Colbert. Oh, nice. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Has anyone been to Japan, yeah. Kyoto, Japan? Yes. I lived in Okinawa for two years. Oh, beautiful. I was an ALT there for a little while. Okay. So when you just just talking about your experiences, especially about the uh, the young girls uh, in there, um, brought back some uh, memories. <laughs> yeah, just just uh, it's especially with the differences I noticed in Japan versus um, just being in Canada with high school students, and um, I can totally see what you said about uh, you know the, the the creep of I don't know how to word this properly, but. Yeah, uh, uh, just 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 the issues, the the the, the emotional maturity and all that, like just mm -hmm. running into trouble with technology. I can see that uh, being a lot worse than it was when I was there eight years ago. So, you, were you on the jet program too? I was. Yeah. All right. I was a jet in. And I, I kind of, for two thousand five to two thousand. Excuse me, two thousand five to two thousand ten. To two thousand ten. That's when I started, 2010 to 2012. Okay. You were a unicorn. You were a five-year. <laughs> I, I was the first five-year in my prefecture, yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I was supposed to be just... I'd love to connect with you later. I, I'm going to head off here. Okay. Not, um, not the wise conversation. Do you want any <laughs> specific information about the projects or doing them with your students? I, just let me know your context or 
what you might be interested in, and I'll suggest some some things to use if if you're interested. Oh, I'm, I'm so interested. You'll you'll hear from me for sure. Okay, Thanks great. again for sharing all that stuff. Beautiful. Uh, fantastic work, man. I'm in total awe. Oh, thanks, Tony. Thank you. Have a good one. Hi, Shelley. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing all right. Has any has anybody had any other questions that they didn't have answered before? Or I mean, you, is there a particular project you might wanted to hear a little bit more about, or? I wondered about your. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, you're a little faint, but I can hear you. Okay, I just wondered if your app was okay for working in the Middle East. I'm working in Amman, Jordan, uh, K twelve education, and I just wanted to make sure it was all good. For Amman, you. Jordan. Um. I will say that I have, I've had some regional issues with my app because I use Google Forms and the back end is based on the Google Cloud and iCloud API. So I know that it can't be used in mainland China because all that's, a lot of that stuff is blocked. So there are, I haven't heard of other than China, some regional issues, but it's possible and I don't know for that specific region, yes or no. But if Google, you can see Google and you use Google okay, it should be all right. Um, I've set the app available in internationally, so you can you should be able to download it. And uh, Apple tells me that it hasn't been blocked in any region as of the last time I checked. So probably, <laughs> but I don't know for sure. Aww. No, that's awesome. Thank you. I just downloaded. What is this app. place? Uh, Maxwell, we're having a conference, and that's what we're doing. Come on over here, and I'll tell you about it. Okay. <laughs> if I may give, give you a little encouragement. Sure, yeah, I love that. You know, when people start griping about how technology is going to ruin your brain and da 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 da, um, I used to say that about reading books. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I said that about TV. Oh. Yeah, because um, I didn't go into it, but usually when I introduce the idea of um, the evolution of technology, I usually talk a little bit about how this. There was warnings and um, some uh, reputation about you know using this new technology, even in print, like you can like the burning of the bill of the Library of Alexandria and things like that, right? So um, I'm I'm optimistic, and when I talk about these issues, I only do it because I usually talk in a lot of commercial settings. These developers that are hopping in and doing a lot of stuff, innovative stuff, but they don't necessarily take a lot of the stuff into consideration. Much like what I think Facebook <laughs> and a lot of these platforms didn't do, so I'm just trying to put it out there to try to put these into developers' minds, and that's why I, technically this is supposed to be in the developer track. So that's what I was I was trying to give some context for developers uh, from an educational perspective. But yes, um, I agree. It's not. It's not all bad, and I'm very optimistic myself. I'm gung ho. I wouldn't be here otherwise. <laughs> Can you join right. my? That's it. There you go. Okay. So there you go. Bye. <laughs> See ya. Have a good one. So, Christy, you're at uh, Chapel Hill. You're you're a student. Um, both a student, uh, I'm in a grad program here and also just started full time as an instructional media <coughs> producer at our school of medicine. Oh, wow. Well. So I, sp I suppose um, you're looking we're... into VR and AR I to supplement that. medical training yeah. in some way. Are you enjoying yes, the yes. conference? Um, that's, that's why they yeah, brought me on here, is they're starting to, just to starting to get into yeah. the VR space. Well, that's a really tonight. exciting time. Um, yeah. And our first project is actually uh, uh, going to be a patient point of view in. simulation. Um, I'm just listening in at the moment. Thank you. So it'll okay. be from Thank the patient's you. perspective going through a trauma resuscitation in the emergency department. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, uh, the goal behind that is to help develop empathy for the patient perspective yeah. and understanding for how interactions um, from providers impact mm -hmm. the patient's experience. 
there's a lot of that stuff that my research group is working on around empathy and and some possible good outcomes of it. Um, we have two girls in our group that are from Iran, and they've been doing some great stuff with uh, going around the country and putting giving putting students into uh, virtual tours of Iran and like maybe exploring a mosque or being on a snowy mountain, things you don't necessarily uh, stereotypically be, yeah. would think about when you think of Iran. And so they've been doing some great stuff to kind of empathize with different cultures and things like that. Um, on the medical end, um, I worked at a university um, when I was doing a lot of those other projects and I helped uh, the medical information uh, school do a project based around augmented reality. Um, so it was for elderly. We have an aging population problem in Japan, especially in rural areas. Uh, we're the oldest mm -hmm. country in the world, right? Most people over 100, most ratio of people over 100 uh, in Japan. So um, this was, have you ever played any of those dance, dance revolution games where you like get tracked and you get different <laughs> scores and in, in, uh, in like a video game? Yeah. So what we did is we took that concept and we pointed a, a web camera out and did some telepresence, telecommuting into these local areas around Japan. And we they have these old traditional Japanese style dances where um, they used to do it, you know, they still do it these days, but, and so we would mm -hmm. play their old traditional music and program the AR to track, to see if they were doing their old traditional dances. <laughs> some of them just with a oh, wow. from the waist up and start giving them scores and sort of kind of gamifying and using kind of their old um, kind of like a um, in Japanese it's called natsukashi is like um, the, the novelty of seeing something old new again right and, and trying to get that to motivate them to have more physical exercise and that came mm -hmm. with mixed results <laughs> I should say but that was interesting use of it yeah, that is really neat. Um, we're also uh, just starting to think about incorporating AR into our curriculum. Um, on campus for a class project, before I came into this position, we did just a, kind of like a proof of concept um, for both a VR and AR tour the sustainability sites on campus. Um, mm. So the the VR portion of it, you, of course, would um, be in a headset, and uh, we took 360 videos around campus um, and added interaction, so you could click on the, we have an edible campus, um, so we have plants growing in different places, you could see what's growing, um, <laughs> or you could go to the bus stop and get on a bus and then get off the bus mm. somewhere. Um, and then the AR portion, um, actually, Got uh, I, di I didn't know of another program at the time, so um, but I had used ArcGIS Online, so mm. they had an AAU Geo um, app that you could mm. basically set geolocations for mm -hmm. um, markers. Um, and so our proof of concept was to combine that mm. with then, once you got to the marker, you could um, see more information about that specific spot on campus. Um, and I thought it would be really cool to eventually make the app where once you got to the physical location, that alone, while you had that app mm. open, would trigger um, whatever the media is that you want to play. Um, there's a lot but I of, haven't actually gotten to see that yet. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of case studies and a lot of research on that about that general thing. Pokemon Go, of course, is, has, already has a slew of papers around that kind of idea. Yeah. And I think you maybe have seen some of the stuff I mentioned around the campus at my university. We're doing a lot of stuff like that, too. Um, I, we have these posters of my orientation cards all around campus, and students are connecting them with different kind of personal stories, just like on a bench. So like, this is where yeah. I have lunch with my friend every day. And so when students come for open campus, <laughs> Um, I have a group of student volunteers that just hand over an iPad and just say, whenever you see these things, just point it at it and different stories will pop up. The idea is not to give them a formal tour, like this is the library, this is what you do here, this is the history, but kind of, kind of connect students with other students, kind of like this is a physical place and then connect a personal story to it. 
And that's where I found it to be yeah. a little bit more uh, appealing and um, um, powerful as far as a medium goes. And that's what the, what the wall is, does too. So you go up to the wall and you see a bunch of videos of, of students and it's all connected to one physical location. So that's what I'm trying to play with as well. Yes. Um, it's very, I, that is very important because that's, that's how we've learned to process the world is the presence of being in a physical presence and then also through the stories of others. I mean, that, that's humanity right there. A, um, so it's great to see you're combining it. There's a lot of technical issues with that type of uh, thing that you mentioned, though, like going to a, a physical place and having stuff pop up automatically based on your location. Uh, one is that mm -hmm. GPS is not 100% accurate and it's not that accurate. Uh, like pinned down to a surface surface location, so it's easy to get yeah. a miss ping because it's basically triangulating your position to a couple of towers, cell towers, or it might tie that location to a Wi-Fi signal. That's happening a lot with these companies now too. So it's easy to trick mm -hmm. or fool or get misinformation by using location data only. And so that's why mm -hmm. um, when I was doing the at the rally, I had to basically just, I took all the, I was tracking location data, but just to ping where the students or the where that action took place. But it's really just about the, the trigger of looking at that image. It was image recognition only. So uh, I, I, had some, yeah. I had some really big issues trying to implement location data as a prime source of augmenting information. It's okay for Pokemon Go because a Pikachu be not not being here and not being over there is not a big deal. But when you're on yeah. a campus and you're in front of a statue, you, you really want to be getting information about what that statue is, not you know, when you're like, you know, 50 meters away or something. <laughs> yes, that's very true. Um, all our medical students are issued um, iPads when they started our school, and uh, we are going to be looking into use cases for um, whether there is anything they could be using their iPods for in AR that would enhance their learning. Um, so we're just at the beginning of that, that kind of brainstorming phase. Great. Well, um, if you could show them the orientation, I'd be very helpful because yes. really trying to, it's just that simple concept. I think there's so many case uses that I haven't thought of yet, and I'm really eager to see what other people might think of for this type of situation. And the other reason why I'm passionate about this project is what I tried to talk a little bit about it before is all this commercial stuff that's happening around this space and mixing it with students in a, in a public school is really starting to, I don't know, I wouldn't say go bad, but it's, it's really starting to bother me as far as data collection, privacy and all that stuff goes. So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's why I'm hoping to have something that's even get semi-popular and sort of like standardized and that's free and have a, have a nice example that's um, to people that are developing or coming up with these business models that, that they can point to a free open source privacy by design example. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Hey, yeah. Uh, thank you for your interest and what, what your good luck with all that your all the projects that you're doing. I'm sure like the medical field Excel has got tons of great potential and already a lot of good stuff happening around immersive stuff mm -hmm. both with augmented and virtual reality virtual reality there's a lot of trainings for like surgeries and and um, medical trainings but there's already been use of things like a hollow lens and things like that during surgery i wouldn't want to be yeah i wouldn't want to be participating in one yet <laughs> if i were under the scalpel but um, <laughs> <laughs> um but I, it's very yeah, promising I know. <laughs> One of our um, physicians slash researchers at our school um, actually has been working with that, um, using the HoloLens uh, essentially to uh, do an overlay of the mm. patient's information um, while he's operating. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's really interesting <laughs> how uh, both learning and doing um, actions as well as processing are really being developed by these technologies. Mm -hmm. A lot of cool stuff. Yes. A couple of years ago, I worked on a project um, to uh, help um, Asperger's and high level 
uh, autism children uh, learn how to behave mm -hmm. in public. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that uh, we can have them in situations where it's impossible to hurt anyone else. Mm. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, my two qu two teachers quit. <laughs> that was the end of that. But <laughs> yeah, there's um, anxiety stuff that my research group is working on too. There's a group um, in Nagoya. Uh, they're they're doing they're doing two different things with anxiety. They're doing a pre-study abroad anxiety reduction study so like before you go overseas for the first time to spend a year in from japan to like the united states or canada or australia the we put them into vr and we walk them from their host family's house to the campus or um, things like that and trying to see if that will reduce their either their cognitive load or their stress levels and let them concentrate more on, you know, interacting with people and, and such. The other study that uh, that same group is doing is um, about pres pres presentation anxiety. So there's a couple of new softwares out where you put a person on a stage, a virtual stage, and then you can control the audience for different things. So you can make them more hostile. In the worst case scenario, you can make them just stare at you blankly. I guess that's the biggest stress <laughs> that you can have as a presenter is just have people just stare at you with no re with no reactions to what you're talking about whatsoever. And practice. You kind of like here and all yeah, space. A little bit, a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. But yeah, so they're trying to see what kind of effect that has on their actual presentation in front of people skills as far as trying to reduce their anxiety. and. Um, training for, for public speaking too. <laughs> Shelly, um, Georgina, any uh, comments? The research. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to ask that the research that you just mentioned about pre study abroad um, to help with anxiety um, is, is that uh, is there anything published about that yet? I don't know it... yet. I don't. I think they've done a presentation or two that might be available on YouTube or something. Um, okay. our, our group is called MAVER, Mixed Augmented Virtual Realities and Learning. We're a special interest research group based here in Japan. So if you went to maver.site or you just went to my website, ericoxon.com, there's links to it as well. There's a list of all of the people in the group and uh, kind of a listing of the past presentations and projects that everybody in our group is doing. So maver.site for that. And awesome. I, I, I will definitely check that out. Great. We talked about empathy. I don't really have any, any questions or anything, but I, I'm just, I'm a lurker. Um, I used to be a high school biology teacher. And when I was a high school biology teacher, I did the flip classroom where I did all uh, lectures on video and then they actually watched the lectures and then we did labs and stuff in class. It was really, really different at that time. But um, I've been out of the classroom now for about six years, but I'm now in business and in marketing and I'm working on not just uh, integrating VR into education, but also integrating it into digital marketing mm -hmm. and figuring out how I can use it to kind of disrupt the marketing space to get attention long enough that they'll look at my product or service. <laughs> it's actually really interesting. Have you ever seen the hyper reality YouTube video? I haven't. So I think it's called hyper reality or something. YouTube video. It's like a dystopian like future a dystopian where uh, you go into a supermarket to a and supermarket it knows and everything knows about you and it says, oh, you need dog you food. food and a little dog, a virtual dog, dog pops up in your eyesight and it tries to guide you to the dog food aisle, etc. That's great. And in the middle of it, yeah, if you watch it, just to see how, like you can put tons of stuff in a person's field of view. Of and this mm -hmm. is what I call, I, I, for lack I call, of a better word, the phone on the face era that's coming face with augmented reality. Augmented reality. And then a lot of marketers are looking right. for that to give you, because yeah. uh, I don't know if you're there for my presentation, but I, I talked about the botany thing where we're going
and direct to the, the answer. And because of the AI systems, we know where we are and what we're looking at, et cetera, and we uh, get the answer right away. A lot of marketers are thinking that way as far as getting the product in front of your face. Good night. Thanks, Peter. Good night. Good night. Good night. May you be successful in your venture. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Yeah, I think the biggest um, excitement about VR and marketing is just the disruptive nature of it. Um, when you, you know, if you go into a store and your mind is on, I don't know, dishwashing soap, but all of a sudden with, with the magic of VR and augmented reality, you can show them a million other things that should be interesting to them. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's very disruptive, right? It, it disrupts your tra train of thought that you were going to go get the dishwashing soap, and now you've got 52 other things that you're going to get. Um, and I'm looking at that from a digital perspective. So I'm looking at mm -hmm. online advertising and on mm -hmm. uh, how to get the online customer to pay attention to my products or services. So it's really a different approach, and I don't think it's been used a whole lot yet. Um, I've, I've used uh, Facebook Spaces quite a bit, and that was great until that went down. So now I'm looking at other avenues of being able to get into like Facebook Lives and um, just get that very different look and feel to an advertising piece so that people stop long enough to take a look at what you've got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, I, what, I, what I see a lot of parallels with the, the internet marketing and the augmented marketing space is that, I mean, you're tracked on for the cookies and all this stuff to kind of target mm -hmm. the data and ads. When we start putting mm -hmm. our phone on our face, well, that data is now going to be connected to where we are and what we're looking at. So if we picked up a mm -hmm. bottle of detergent at the store and we're wearing these glasses, you might, you know, be able to put yourself into an online auction to display an ad. Like, mm -hmm. you, like we do online right now. We go to a particular website and then something like something crazy like 50 different auctions happen to display you an ad sometimes <laughs> mm -hmm. to see, yep. like, to, yeah. you know, compare your interests and what you're looking at and your browsing history and all that stuff. Yeah, it's amazing. It's going to be scary. It's scary, though, from a from a consumer perspective. It's just like, oh, man, I don't I, I get hit hard enough with email <laughs> and with text messages and uh, phone calls and stuff like that. So this is another layer of that. So I, I look at it from the marketer side and think, oh my gosh, the doors are wide open. But then consumer side, I'm like, gosh, Shelly, don't open those doors too much. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, I think about this moving towards the future a lot. And what I kind of see happening, especially with the businesses in the last 10 years or so, with different companies being bought and convinced and making different business models, is there seems to be sort of two different models. And so the ad-free world, the less targeted world, you just have to be able to be in that premium subscription space. And then if you don't mm -hmm. can only afford all the subscription stuff, then you're going to be tracked and you're going to be shown ads and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's kind of a disturbing trend because it kind of, there's a, there's a disparity, a growing gap just in the way we get information with that kind of process that's happening with different business models. Well, when you're looking at a startup business, I mean, they're just trying to get anything out there, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, it's even harder for them because they don't have the budget to be able to hit hard that, that marketing that the bigger companies can use. Mm -hmm. So my actual, where I focus most is teaching people how to do it organically, which mm -hmm. is really interesting. Yeah. So um, that's, but that's the challenge because if you're going to market organically, meaning not paying for ads, then you have to be seen. You have to disrupt the, the normal flow of information be able to make them stop and look and that's what VR does. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of organic marketing through organic immersive learning. Mm-hmm. Very different. Sorry, I've been standing for an hour or two now. <laughs> 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 All right, well, I'm going to bounce out because it is definitely my bedtime. <laughs> yeah, it's, 
Thank you so much for everything, sharing your information. Thank you. Thanks for your interest. And have a wonderful, wonderful night. You too. Good night. Okay. Yeah, I'm probably going to sleep too. It is now 12:30 in the morning. <laughs> it's like three or in the night. <laughs> three afternoon in Japan here, so I'm gonna go get some food. I skip my lunch. Good luck, Christy, well, and the medical stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs>